My name is Jeff Jacobson. I work for a company called Copen Corporation. We initially got started in making the very first micro displays commercially available in the world back in the early 90s, primarily for military applications at the time. Then they migrated into consumer. I've been working in this space doing what we now call augmented reality, head-worn, near-eye applications with the military, the spooks, and commercial applications for the last 25 years. Industry and enterprise has become very interested in wearables because, effectively, life is never hands-free. So if you can free up the individual's hands to be able to perform their work and obtain the information that they need and communicate with their fellow workers without having to use their hands to do that, they can get more work done. So they're interested in hands-free communications and commuting, uh, computing improvements in safety and in performance. Now, knowledge transfer is also important. People want to be able to be trained on the job. And one of the ways to do that is to be able to share within your community information from experts and especially remote experts that aren't there with you at the time. So major companies have found that knowledge transfer and use of hands-free, on-demand video collaboration is a powerful solution for on-the-job training and knowledge transfer. Now, there are borders to doing AR. And what we found in 20 years of work is that the effective mixture of industrial design, software, and especially now user interface is extremely important to eliminating issues that you have with environment, the use case, the application, the geolocation, cross-platform performance in an enterprise operation. And then the last three are more lessons learned, starting where you are, finding your ROI, and the user interface. We keep coming back to the user interface. OK, in the environment, are you operating indoors or outdoors? Or do you operate in both? Do you operate in the daylight or at nighttime? Or do you operate in both? Then you go to the use case. Do you wear protective clothing in your operation? Could be uh, gowning and uh, clothing to protect you from biohazards and chemicals, as well as abrasion. But it could be as simple as wearing heavy gloves, or jackets, or uh, eye protection and breathing apparatus. The geolocation. <laughs> Do you find yourself sometimes having to operate or you find your employees operating in an environment that can be moist and also very cold? Or do you find yourself out in the desert, in a desert environment, working in ambient temperatures during the day of 50 to 60 degrees C? All of these play an important role in the selection, development, design, of the system that you're going to deploy out there for enterprise applications. In the bottom left-hand corner, you see a lot of metal. Is there a lot of metal in the areas where you're working? Is that going to diminish or deprive you of wireless communications? So you get to the cross-platform operation and security. When you're trying to introduce wearable technology, in this case, augmented reality or mixed reality, into an enterprise, They've already got an established platform for desktops, notebooks, tablets, and cell phones. They manage all those. They operate on all those. And if that wearable device can't come into that environment and leverage the software that they're currently using right now, you have a huge gap that you have to tra traverse. You cannot take somebody and tell them that they need to rewrite their software or they need an entirely new operating platform in order to use wearables along with the normal enterprise applications that they're running today. So you need to be able to take a guy that's using a tablet computer and in an hour show him how to use a wearable device and send him into the field. And those images that he sees are the same size, same resolution, perform exactly the same functions as efficiently as what he was doing before on his tablet and hopefully because now he's hands free more efficiently. So finding your, your ROI. I don't, you know, I can't even hardly see your faces out there. The lights are so bright. But you go through these types of conferences and you're overwhelmed by all of the innovation and all the cool stuff that people are doing and all the new computer graphics, positional information, etc. And it can be daunting, especially for enterprise people coming into an environment like this who typically haven't been exposed to this before. Now they're being chartered by their company to come up with a solution to begin to take advantage of this technology in their company. So what I've learned in the last few years working with large companies like Boeing or General Electric, um, 
they're taking these technologies, and although they study them and they have teams of people, even scientists, uh, looking at the bleeding edge of what's capable, when they get into actual deployment, they're just looking to do blocking and tackling. How do I take and reduce a team size, a task time? How do I reduce the errors in the normal operation? How do I improve quality and at the same time improve my cost structure for doing service and maintenance? Simple example. GE has power plants located all over the world that they service and maintain. Some are hydroelectric, some are nuclear. Some work off of water moving past blades and, and repellers. Some of them work off of steam. These systems have to be monitored and maintained. So very frequently, they'll have to open up these vessels and allow a person in. Now, there's enough room for a man to get around inside, but there's not much room to set up shop. So you, you're not going to be carrying a tablet or a PC in there. So what do they have to do? They send a guy with a mic not this kind of mic, but uh, a micro, micrometer, inside to be able to take measurements at cr critical and strategic positions within the system to monitor the wear and tear on the system and how much service and repair should be done. Even opening up and looking at certain bearing surfaces. But he can't type any information, so they hired a, another guy to sit at the opening for these vessels they crawl into or these large pieces of equipment to hear him read off the mic reading. The guy that hears the information then turns to another guy sitting in a more comfortable position who can type the information into a format that they can retain the information and study it. Problem was, is that they were talking about hundreds of, of readings in a group of readings and thousands of readings in a system, and they found that about 25% of the time, there were errors. The guy would finish reading the last reading inside the vessel, but the guy outside still had three or four boxes to fill. Where did he miss the information? Or the guy's completely finished outside and the guy's still reading information on readings on the inside. So their solution was, they, they took a head-worn device that we had developed, they took their micrometer, they added a Bluetooth interface to it so that the display system on the head-worn system would allow them to see precisely where they needed to take and make a measurement. At the same time they were taking that measurement, Bluetooth sent it directly to the headset. The headset then sent the information off to the company server so they could compare real-time information on every measurement taken on that class of system anywhere in the world, and it could compare the last readings that were taken off the same system that he's currently measuring right now, and they could determine whether that information was important or not, and it also allowed them to validate the information immediately. Now, it's a very simple thing, but what they ended up doing was they took a task that took three men entire days to do, gave it to one man. The one man is now making zero mistakes, and he enjoys doing his job a lot more because he doesn't have the hassles of having to redo over and over again situations that would arise. So, in removing these borders, my first advice that I could share would be forget the complicated, simplify. If you can't bring a wearable augmented reality device into your operation and leverage the software and the platforms that you're currently using right now, you have a, a, a big chasm that you're going to have to cross in order to get these, these new devices in there. You want to have an augmented reality device that will allow you to use everything that you're currently using now and begin to add to it. You want to be able to provide simple things. This gets down to blocking and tackling. People in the world operate off of PDFs, drawings, and graphics. They operate off of video clips. In fact, if you've got a point of view camera and you've got a guy that's excellent at doing something, he can make a video on a, uh, an activity that he performs that maybe is only performed rarely amongst everyone in the corporation. But at a moment's notice, anyone can pull that video down, browse through it, refamiliarize themselves, and then perform the repair or service that's required. Still images, just managing still images of what's damaged, what's being repaired, and why. Same thing with video clips. And being able to do all of that, including make hands-free calls and ask for data without having to pull out your phone or pull out another device and sit and tap on it. <clears throat> you gotta be able to do these things well and practically before you can ever expect the enterprise environment to readily accept and adopt augmented reality. And when you can do these, then step gen gingerly and appropriately into mixed reality. Go step by step. Add remote expert. 
give the guy the ability to spontaneously contact the best guy that is available anywhere in the world to see what he's doing and give him advice so that he can get on with his work and the other guy doesn't have to travel there. Okay, that, that sounds pretty straightforward, but that's really hard for a lot of people right now. Geolocation, adding geolocation, positioning information on the user, and health monitoring. Again, simple things. Don't, there's not a lot of complicated graphics and information there. Just being able to monitor these things and let the individual know that he's overheating, that he probably needs to stop, get something to drink, or the altitude's affecting him. Um, Mobile group video conferencing, being able to pull people from a, a vendor and a customer together all at the same time spontaneously and present information wherever they might be to get an answer so that you can move on with your work, like Boeing building an aircraft. The last thing that you need to be overwhelmed with is trying to put overlaid computer information and 3D animation over reality. Because if you can't do the, all of the steps above, you have severely limited your ability to penetrate the enterprise environment and give them a return on their investment immediately. People aren't doing that right now today, but they are doing everything else that's up there. It's just more cumbersome. So make it easy for them to do what they currently do and put yourself in a position to be able to add that AR capability that we're all looking at at this show uh, as an augmentation to what they're currently doing. Now, Stress, comfort, and safety, you know, balance, heat of the device, um, safety, protective clothing that you're wearing, uh, direct impact, what happens if you fall down and hit your face on the stairs, you have to go to the hospital. Um, it's got to be convenient, because if it's not convenient, your enterprise organization is not going to embrace it. The people that are actually doing the work are going to say, it, it's bothersome, I don't like it, I don't want to use it. They'll find ways to get out from using it. But if you make it easy to clean and replace, you make it reasonable for them to be able to handle it. They can put it in their toolbox without having to have a special case to put it in. We're not looking at providing the enterprise jewelry, we're looking at providing them with a better tool. The tools that they have fit in their tool, in their tool belt, on their tool belt, in their toolbox right now. They throw them on their seats, they get intermingled. If you build devices that are too fragile, they won't be used, they won't be purchased. Um, Maintaining connectivity, you have any idea the hundreds of field trials and evaluations that have taken place in the industry where they intermittently keep losing their Wi-Fi or losing their Bluetooth interface and the person has to stop and reconnect all over again? If you're going to use or leverage that technology, make sure that it's auto-recovering so that if it loses it, before the guy's even said anything, it's now recovered and it's back where it was. Make it intuitive, support multitasking, you want to help these people reduce their task time, reduce the errors that they would encounter during performing their tasks, help them to anticipate historical mistakes that are made during performing various operations, improve reporting and documentation. I mean, we take for granted that we go through college now, we come out, we use computers, we type on screens. We're pretty comfortable at creating documents and information, but there's a lot of people that are, are, are basically coming from an industrial background that type with two fingers. It takes them a long time to try and capture the information from the tasks that they just performed and give instructions to the next person. Make it easy for them to be able to do that. Then you get into safety. Don't block their peripheral vision. What you don't see left or right is what you'll run into. What you don't see above your head there was an experiment done at a major company where they just took people that were six feet or taller and gave them an opening that they had to go through at various times during the day that was only 5'8". But they all wore caps or, or hard hats. Almost everybody going through the first time banged their head because when they're looking and walking straight through, they don't see the top of the opening. It just looks free and clear. But if they gave them several tasks to perform and tasked them to do it again, they'd bang their head several more times. And then eventually, they were sensitized. They would walk through the opening, bent over like they were underneath a helicopter blade. So don't block their peripheral vision. Don't block their, their normal, natural hearing. If you take away a man's ability to avoid danger, you take upon yourself the liability for whatever danger he runs into. Operate in dim and, and light environments. If you have people that are operating in environments like where you're sitting right now, and then you have people that are operating in, in bright light environments, those systems that you're looking at procuring or you're looking at selling need to be able to allow people to easily be able to do that. Um, an interesting sidebar, 
in the 20 plus years that we've been doing work for the military. And over 90% of whatever is viewable in a head-worn, heads-up display system, whether it's jet fighter helmets, rotorcraft helmets, gun scopes, night vision, you go through that whole list, we supply about 90% of those applications out there in industry and in the military now. There's only one place that the military will give you see-through information on a see-through optical device. And that's to put a reticle on top of an object or an individual to remove the object or kill the individual. They don't provide maps and they don't provide lots of other documentation because if you're carrying a gun and you're walking through a dangerous environment, it's what's, what you can't see that's likely to kill you. It's what you can't hear that's likely to kill you. So you have to be able to build these augmented reality systems to be used in industrial environments that allow people to retain their natural protection, their natural capability to watch out for themselves. Um, another sidebar would be <clears throat> it's unlikely that you'll find people in most situations, especially working indoors, wearing sunglasses because the light can be bad to begin with. And even if you're outside and you open up a box and your eyes and your pupils have reduced down for the ambient environment you're working in, you look into a dark box, you can't see anything in there anyway. So sunglasses aren't a good idea, but another good idea. Um, if you look at these lenses that are typically used on protective glasses, they're made out of polycarbonate, materials like Lexan or something. They make bumpers out of those materials because they're very durable. Don't stick electronics and optics in the safety space between your optic and your eye, because if you ever take a direct blunt force trauma to the front of those glasses, you're going to be pulling those optics out of your eye socket. So we get down to user interface. This is probably one of the biggest areas for being able to impact augmented reality in a daily application right now. Wearables demand hands-free operation. If I have to have a wearable device and all I've got up here is a secondary display, but I have to pull something out of my pocket and work it with both hands, or I have, have a tablet on my wrist and I have to sit here and do this, what's the big advantage in having the display up here? It's nominalized, marginalized. I might as well just pull out something and look at it. And smartphones have gotten pretty damn good and the displays are pretty damn big. So they want to be hands-free. Now, touch. It diminishes their ability to perform functions because you take the tools out of their hands, they can no longer climb, they can't crawl, they can't go anywhere unless they stop. So we get into this, touch is great for many of the devices we have today, but if you really want to see your, your wearable device deployed in the industry and you want to see it grow rapidly, you're going to have to use a combination of speech and gesture and some other technology to make it efficient. Now, people will laugh and say that, you know, speech doesn't work. Yeah. We've been doing speech work within our company for a number of years. And a normal office, a quiet office, is about 40, 45 decibels, just to give you an idea. Um, a lot of you that may have Apple phones tried to use Siri, talk into it, and say, well, if anybody else is talking, if I'm in a busy, noisy car, if there's wind noise around, it doesn't work or it gives me bad information. That's only because it's trying to listen to the noise and figure out what the noise has contextually to do with the request that you made. So you need a speech recognition solution that allows you to operate in those 75 to 110 decibel environments efficiently and effectively without having to talk very loud. You want to go ahead and play this video? Um, this is a demonstration of noise cancellation in 2008. There's only two microphones, one on the left hinge, one on the right hinge of the glasses the guy is wearing. Turn the volume up. You can turn it up louder than that.
Interestingly, I did not hear a single word I am saying. Now Again, you hear the same thing, DB, frame for frame, races, without the noise cancellation. November the 8th, 2008. minutes <clears throat> in, <laughs> in room 208 or excuse me 209 or 210 I have an associate that's speaking specifically on how you accomplish this noise cancellation what is readily available right now now what you saw was nine years ago think about the improvement that's been made in this space in nine years so if you have an interest please see Dash and Fan's presentation uh, in half an hour that's it. Any questions? A uh, couple of quick questions sure. asking myself. Um, so, since you did the the split with Motorola Solutions and you've you've taken the Golden Eye um, and house it at uh, entirely at Copen, so you're productizing this now yourself. You're not doing it as just a reference model. This is. We took the. <clears throat> We built seven prior generations of GoldenEye over a 10-year period, and we perfected it to a high degree. Uh, it was very well adopted, the few numbers that we made, by some of the largest companies in the world. But traditionally, we haven't been a product systems manufacturer. So some of the guys that worked for me on GoldenEye for several years left and formed a company called uh, Realware. And Realware has taken the GoldenEye design just as it was. They've upgraded the processor, and now they're producing a device that has the noise cancellation and the basic features and capabilities that I was describing up there. Oh, okay, but, but my question was is, like, I, I've been speaking to Ernesto, who does the solos, um, and you have, so you're developing your own brands now mm -hmm. in the consumer space, and I was wondering if you are doing the same um, in, in, in the enterprise industrial space, or if, or if that's still a reference model, is it, like, can a company purchase that? Or, or, is, it a, or, or is it a reference model? That's, you see what I'm saying? You, okay. Um, can a company purchase the... The GoldenEye. The GoldenEye. Yeah. We don't manufacture the GoldenEye. Right. And okay. that, uh, that, at this time, we have not announced any products coming forward in GoldenEye. Um, I guess you might say that we continue to monitor and supply critical and strategic components and technology to the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, we encourage people to learn from the work that we've done, but we have not launched uh, a GoldenEye product. Okay. Uh, that was what I was getting clarification on, just because I knew that you were, you were getting into products and building your own brands in the consumer space, and I just... Right, right. So, yeah. um, Great. Who knows? We'll wait and see. Uh, what, big what fan happens. of Copen, by the way, and your founder, John. Big fan of John Fan. Um, John Fan's right back there. 